Hello and welcome to Global Eye with me, Parikshit Lutra. It's been one year of the Ukraine-Russia war and EU and the United States and all Western allies have promised to keep up the support for Ukraine against Russia in this war. Having said that, the Ukraine war dominated the agenda when G20 ministers met in New Delhi and Bengaluru. There was no communique, no consensus over the war. There were sharp differences on the wording of the communique as well. What's the way forward for uh, geopolitics, for the Ukraine-Russia war, and what role can India play with its G20 presidency? With us today is uh, the European Union High Representative on Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell. Mr. Borrell, thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Thank you to you for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Borrell, what was your message to India during its G20 presidency and the meetings here in New Delhi? That the European Union is very much engaged uh, on the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but we don't forget the rest of the world. And there are many other places that need that we engage with them. Among others, India, which is a privileged partner. India is going to play an important role on the world geopolitics, on this multipolar world. And we want to engage much more with, with India in order to try to solve the global problems. Uh, Mr. Borrell, what was your own message to Sergei Lavrov, to the Russian foreign minister, in the G20 meetings here in New Delhi? Uh, was there tension in the room when all the foreign ministers came together with Russia and China in the room? Well, tensions, no. It was quite a civilized meeting. Everyone was sitting far away from the other, and everyone explained what they think about. We were happy this time because Minister Lavrov remained in the room to listen to us. In Bali, he spoke and he left. There is a big improvement because this time he spoke and he remains seated to listen to us. And the message was clear. Take your troops out of Ukraine. Stop the war. Stop the invasion. Abide by the United Nations Charter. Right. Uh, having said that, do you feel India could have played a stronger role in terms of making sure the G20 communicate? Both in uh, the finance trap meeting and now in the foreign minister's meeting, we did not see a communique because Russia and China did not want paragraphs on Ukraine to be included in the joint statement as well. Do you think India should have played a stronger role there? Well, India did uh, whatever he could, but uh, it was clear from the beginning that uh, uh, Russia will not accept any mention about the war in Ukraine. They didn't accept it in Bali. In Bali was not a communique, neither. It was a statement from the presidency, because in Bali, Ch China and Russia didn't accept any mention to the war. And I was convinced that they were going to do exactly the same thing this time. So India tried, but uh, it was an impossible mission. Mm -hmm. Give us your sense, uh, the war in Ukraine, it's been one year now, it continues to rage on. President Putin has vowed to step up the offensive in Ukraine. What is your assessment of where the war stands right now? Are we any closer to a diplomatic solution, Mr. Borrell? I would like very much to be close to a diplomatic solution. But everyone that has been talking with uh, President Putin has came back with the same message. He has military objectives and he will continue the war until he gets these objectives. It means to continue bombing, destroying Ukraine, killing civilians and civilian infrastructure, and pursuing the war. Uh, this is Putin who started the war, and it's Putin who has to stop it. Right. Uh, the war, uh, and this is what the IMF chief, Kristalina Georgieva, also said, that it's very uncertain how the war will involve. That shadow will continue looming on the world economy. Do you think President Putin has enough resources to continue waging this war through 2023? We try to diminish the resources that Russia is getting from its uh, oil and gas. Certainly, they still have a lot, but much less 
because we have been implementing sanctions against the Russian economy, which has not collapsed the Russian economy, but has weakened its resources. Look, at the beginning, before the war, Europe was uh, importing 40% of its gas consumption from Russia, and now it's almost zero. And Russia will not found another client for its gas. For oil, yes, okay, they are selling oil to India, to China, at a discount price. But for gas, it's going to be very difficult for them to look for someone else to buy this gas. China is very far away. So yes, the Russian economy will be hit by our sanctions and by the war. And our purpose is not to punish the Russian people, who are also suffering a lot and having a lot of casualties, but weakening the capacity of Putin to continue the war. Right. Also to uh, ask you about what role can India play with its G20 presidency right now in terms of bringing this war to an end? Russia uh, will not be convinced by nice words. Neither India nor anyone in the world can convince Putin to stop the war by just saying nice words. It's international pressure. It's 141 votes on the United Nations condemning Russia invasion, asking for a ceasefire and for the retreat of Russian troops. Other members of the United Nations, important members as India, have abstained. Well, I understand every country had its own reason, interests and values, and I can understand the relationship of India and many others with Russia. But uh, my, 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 my request to the international community would be to understand that here is not about uh, supporting the West against Russia. It's not the West against Russia or Russia against the West. It's about the Charter of the United Nations. It's about the basic principle and rule and the world in peace. You cannot invade your neighbor. You cannot destroy your neighbor because you are stronger. If this is allowed, if everybody, because it's stronger than the neighbor, can invade the neighbor, and destroy the country if it is unable to conquer, what kind of a world are we going to live? What will be the next step in terms of uh, putting more pressure on Russia as far as bringing the war is concerned? More sanctions on Russia? What, what are you considering, Mr. Porter? Well, more sanctions. It is difficult to put more sanctions because after 10 packages, we have been sanctioning almost everything that we could sanction. Certainly, there are always loopholes, and we have to prevent circumvention of the sanctions that make the sanctions useless. Someone is circumventing them. We have to continue uh, with uh, personal sanctions to the responsibles of what's happening, but we have already sanctioned more than 1,000 people and entities. The important thing is to maintain and continue our support to Ukraine, both military, economically, and humanitarian. Uh Mr. Borrell, coming to the question of further support, you are trying to negotiate a deal, a common contract for supplying ammunition from EU nations to Ukraine in a continued manner, in a sustained manner. Uh, what is the status of that proposal? And number two, what about the request from Ukraine for fighter jets? Look, do you know how many artillery shots the Russian army shooting every day? 50,000. 50,000 artillery shots against Ukrainian cities every day. The Ukrainians need to resist and to answer these attacks. So they need ammunition, a lot of ammunition. And it's completely useless to provide them with uh, guns if they don't provide <laughs> ammunition. And the war is so intense and the Russian artillery is bombing so heavily that uh, the stockpiles of the European armies has been using, uh, providing to Ukraine very quickly. So yes, we have to provide more. It's not because we like it, it's because Ukrainians need it. And well, fighter jet is something that the member states will have to decide. But I remember that about supplying tanks, it was a great discussion three months ago. And now the solution was, uh, the decision was taken to provide battle tanks because certainly Ukraine needs this kind of arms. About fighter jets, let's see what the member states will decide. 
on the India-EU relationship, the bilateral partnership, you've been deepening the partnership a lot with the Indian government. Give us a sense of your priorities of how you would like to evolve your relationship with India, considering uh, the tensions with Russia, considering China's uh, role in the world and China's expansionist tendencies as well. Which sectors, which areas would you like to see the relationship with you and India evolve? There are two privileged sectors, which is which is our energy and digital. Energy means climate. You know, uh, India and China and other big countries will be key in order to stop the, the temperature and the atmosphere. And for that, we need to establish a strong partnership. And we are doing that. I, I know that Germany, for example, has established a partnership with India in order to support the Indian efforts to diminish the consumption of coal. We need to work closer with the countries that still are using a lot of uh, hydrocarbons. Climate and energy, key. Digital, also key. You have a strong capacity on digital evolution. Uh, India has a lot of clever and well-trained people and firms which are at the forefront of the technical uh, development. So on digital, we can also work a lot. And the third issue in which we have to join our forces is on the way in which the world can be a better place to live. And a better pa place to live means, first and foremost, a peaceful place. My final question on the India-EU trade deal. Negotiations have begun. Uh, do you see any roadblocks, any barriers to the trade deal right now? Uh, are you hopeful that we will conclude it this year? It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. This uh, trade agreement has been pending for years. Then came the pandemic and everything stopped. Then came the war and everything was in trouble. But certainly between India and the European Union, there are a lot of economic complementarities, a lot of opportunities for investment. So there are three deals which are on the pipeline. One is the, the trade agreement. Another is the protection of investment. And the third one is in general economic cooperation in multiple sectors in which uh, it would be much better for both if we could advance in our economic partnership. It is on the file, and I hope that in the next month we will show some progress on this file. Representative Borrell, thank you so much for speaking to CNBC TV 18, giving us your view on where we stand one year after the Ukraine-Russia war and the role that India needs to play with its G20 presidency in possibly bringing the war to an end. Thanks once again for being with us here on CNBC. Thank you.